But I think that you, what you've outlined is, um, you know, is really important. And then also, you know, responding to uh, Jennifer's comment in the chat. So I'm going to kind of switch around some things that I might have said otherwise and really um, touch upon something we did discuss yesterday. And, and that's how I think we need a sharper epistemological distinctions in the work that we do, which, which I do address in a forthcoming book, um, which I've mentioned already, it's called Searching for Truth. It's about blockchain technology in, in an age of disinformation, but it really is about um, epistemological muddles that we've gotten ourselves into um, as humanity. And, um, and maybe even as, as, as archival scholars and um, you know, computational archival scholars in, uh, more specifically. So what, when we talk about um, records, uh, we, we often make a mistake about is thinking that we're, you know, the records themselves are some kind of truth. And that when we establish the authenticity of the records, moreover, that we are looking for some kind of ground truth. Uh, and that's a mistake. I think that um, what, what we really want to do here is we want to um, establish the foundations of being able to look at the records as providing some kind of, um, in, from an epistemological perspective, reliable grounds for forming um, assessments about claims, truth claims. So I don't talk about facts, I talk, talk about truth claims. And then the interrogation of those truth claims using different, what I call evidentials, which are records for an example, but could equally be indigenous storytelling. Many other uh, different types of evidentials are valid in different societies. That, that you know that interrogation is where a truth emerges. Now, a truth emerges according to some kind of an epistemological framing um, of what, first of all, the pro a, a valid process of determining the truth is. So, law, for example, Jason's area of expertise um, gives us a legal basis for examining evidence and arriving at what we feel is justifiably true. Um, you know, but it's flawed, right? And all processes of establishing, you know, what is justifiably true beliefs or the knowledge are somewhat flawed and they're grounded in a social, um, a social context. And I would say even nowadays, a socio-informational technical context. And so uh, we, you know, like think back to, to the, an example I cite in the book, Galileo and the Roman church. I mean, Galileo was using science, you know, the scientific methodology, relying on his telescope, his instrumentation. And the church said, you know, that's nonsense. It's, you know, the word of God is what we should do to evaluate, use to evaluate uh, what is justifiably true. So we, you know, different societies and different cultures will have different processes, different sources of authority, and um, that, that's, you know, that's not the work of the archivist to sort all of that out. The work of the archivist and the computational ar archival scientist, I would hazard a guess, is um, first of all, to provide, to protect and preserve evidentials so that they can be relied upon as evidentials in that discussion that will take place down the road epistemologically about what the truth actually is. And that'll get sorted out through these processes. There's like pa power relations come into that. You know, usually like Galileo got chucked in jail. Indigenous peoples were ignored. You know, uh, we talked about the Japanese prisoner of wars, how, you know, their, their, their criminal acts were described by the creators of these records. But, but we now subsequently understand that, that's, that that was their standpoint. It wasn't the standpoint and experience of the people who were themselves incarcerated. So um, that, that's just something I want to really clarify here. And, and that's why I see myself, I, I proudly call myself a neo-Jenkinsonian and a guardian of the record. And, you know, um, why I see like my cybersecurity training is very much in line with my work as an archivist, because I really see 
my job as protecting the integrity of records and their authenticity isn't, you know, broad as a broader framing concept, integrity being part of what is needed to establish authenticity and not just bitwise as we were talking earlier, but records integrity, which is a, a, a broader and more complex and more difficult challenge to solve. Um, I see that as my, my role and to be a guardian of the record now has become a little bit of a, you know, uh, passe, maybe, uh, you know, um, frowned upon because it has the suggestion of keeping people out of the archives, excluding people. Um, but I don't see it that way. Uh, I see that if, if, if not for those who have been guardians of the records, whatever their their own uh, political or epistemological stances. You know, we can look at the Stasi archives, the Iraqi police files, you know, some of these people were marvelous record keepers. So I'm, I'm making, you know, no moral judgment, although I really do hope that I am, you know, a little bit that my impact on the world is, is different <laughs> as a record keeper, but, but we, all, um, we all come from within a particular context. But if not for the preservation of those records, we would not have an evidential foundation through which to pursue social justice objectives. And that's why I think, you know, lots of people in this world seem to be attending to how to evaluate the evidence, um, uh, you know, how to use the evidence for social justice purposes, but only the archivist really attends to the record to protecting the sanctity and the you know the moral uh, integrity of the of the record and 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 you know I just think that we need to attend to that right now in the, in our present you know epistemologically problematic moment um, particularly the the kind of fragmented epistemological space that we find ourselves in so um, I guess you know let me pause there and and let's. You know, I could say so much more about what Michael shared with us because his his ideas and his research is so rich. Um, just there's so much more to say, but I don't I want more discussion and I just value having the opportunity like I'm so it's so felt so lonely, you know, being these times, you know, we work to get but it this, this is our one time to come together as scholars in this space so I really want to leave space for sharing and and um you know challenging i you know of ideas and and real discussion about some of these things so yeah um so i don't know uh if anybody wants to just like open up their mic and say their question um i think peter before you maybe there was jennifer um so maybe i'll start with jennifer's question and invite jennifer you want to say your question or do you want me to read it out Sure. Um, first, if you think the archivist has a duty to add context explicitly to records where it's lacking inherently in the records themselves, so that that context isn't lost for our future researchers, and if so, where do you draw the line between enough and too much for an archivist role? Oh, that's that's a an excellent question. So. Um, in order to really establish the authenticity of records, at least from an archival perspective, we do need, you know, thick description, I would say, of context. So more is, is definitely better. Um, in, in terms of how we incorporate those descriptions of context into archival uh, descriptive tools and, um, and systems is, you know, is always the challenge. Where do you stop? How does this get? you know, represented, uh, but at least, and, the, and this, is, this is a de minimis requirement that isn't even met in rec most record keeping systems. Although of course, you know, we, we do uh, add to this in, in archival descriptive systems, but de minimis, we need the link, some kind of representational link back to the originating action of the record because records spring from human activity. And we don't get that in a lot of record systems. So a lot of my work is in managing current records and which sets up the conditions to even be able to make those records, you know, 
understandable for you know for the archivist who receives them in trying to provide even more context. But I would say you know more context is better. Um, many archival theorists have discussed you know what that how to describe and how to characterize that context. In the context of blockchain specifically, I have been engaging with this in, in trying to think about ontologically, what is a blockchain ecosystem? And basically what I've arrived at is um, what one kind of defining boundary of the context is, what is, what is the juridical system? What is this, this specific system of rules that determine how knowledge is formed in that society. And, and I believe knowledge actually shapes, I'm you know, kind of a philology, you know, draw upon uh, the theory of uh, philology and, and some of the linguistic theorists this way that language and knowledge shape our social reality. And you know, potentially, I'm even a Latourist, so I believe in a very flat ontology. So you know, a network of actants, things, people, you know, all interacting. But um, so I guess what I'm saying there is that the juridical, the system of rules by which we determine, you know, we debate and determine what is the truth actually does help, help us define the boundaries of what, you know, we should describe as being inside of the context for a particular group of records and, and outside of it. But, you know, that's a very broad um, answer. And I don't, I, I think it's an unresolved question myself. So I continue to explore it. That's my offering right now, but it's by no means, you know, the end of the story. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I grappled with this a few years ago, a little bit in a paper called Third Order Archival Systems. Um, like that was back in 2013 when I was doing visual analytics and experimenting with ontologies, but but more recently, like I said, in blockchain. And Peter. Thanks, Vicky. Um, yeah, fascinating topic. And I'm knee deep in it myself right now and um, looking forward to checking out Vicky's excellent, she's such an excellent researcher um, and her input. So my take on this is um, similar to, I've, I've kind of arrived at the same conclusion as Vicky. And uh, I think we discovered on LinkedIn, we we're kind of talking about that we're just trying to struggling with the same thing and and so i i in my for my so what i'm working on right now is i actually do think i, I do want to try to create a type of specification to create that missing link between the archival the, the, the archival science requirements and how we establish and demonstrate provenance so that we can support the protection of authenticity of sources um, and it, I think I agree with Vicky's point that if uh, language um, affects your knowledge and your perception of truth and reality. And so if, you know, a, a specification is a type of language, it's a type of way that we can um, bring to the fore ideas and knowledge that weren't expressed before. And, uh, and again, in a very practical way. And um, so I've, similar to Vicky, I've been thinking about this idea, like this muddling of the language that we have around authenticity, accuracy, truth, evidence, fact. And so I, um, you know, there, I, if, again, I, I believe that there is no such thing as a universal truth. I believe everybody has their own truth. Everybody's going to form their own opinions. Um, but we should be basing them off of established facts so whether something happened in the in the real world again whether that's real or not is a completely philosophical question we have to draw boundaries somewhere but whether we're in a simulation right now or whether whatever what does it let's let's just, let's just assume there's a real world for a second and so whether something has happened in the real world and whether i'm saying what i'm saying to you right now is can be can be a historical fact and um the words coming out of my mouth and being recorded in a zoom call are historical fact there is a there's evidence of that fact is the recording of this Zoom call, and whether you whether what you take what you build the kind of knowledge or experience that you are now experiencing to yourself as you're receiving this information is your truth. It's not my truth, and you might interpret this. Your truth might have a completely different interpretation of the facts, the fact what I'm saying, um, and. It, that and everybody brings that own their own their own history to that uh, equation. So I think it's very valuable what Vicky's saying is if we can establish some type of ontology that says there's there's facts 
things have happened, things happen in the real world. There's evidence of those facts, i.e. records, and then there's truth or interpretation or opinions. And there's a value, it's valuable to like, I get, I'd be more explicit about the relationship between those. Um, and there's a graphic I'm working on that I, some of you might've seen it before. I, I don't haven't finished yet, but I'm working on a blog post around this because um, the background, the work, I, the work I'm doing is um, I'm doing a project in the Cardano blockchain space to create an Oracle based on these types of requirements. Oracles in the ancient world were like um, seers that received messages from the gods and then told the, the, the mortals what the gods were saying. And in the blockchain world, an Oracle, it takes uh, real world data because blockchains are stupid. They only know what's happening on the blockchain. They only, know, they only know about transactions on the blockchain. They don't know what's happening in the real world. So they, but now we have smart contracts that do things like um, create financial contracts based on whether there's a change in price between the Bitcoin price and the US dollar. There might be a betting app that decides, okay, you, you win this bet because Chelsea won 2-1 uh, against Manchester United. That score is a real world fact. There's now more, even more sophisticated things like crop insurance smart contracts so that um, farmers don't have to wait for months to get um, insurance claims filled. So that there's extreme weather event, that data is fed into the blockchain and the smart contract is waiting for that information. If a certain criteria is met, boom, immediately the farmer gets paid out to their wallet. So it's, and then, and then beyond that, we're into, into more interesting things, I think, and more interesting realm is like the political events and whether somebody actually said something or not, or whether something was a deep fake and that kind of thing. So oracles, uh, for now, the, the current crop of oracles are, are really based on mostly security and um, technology kind of like requirements. And none of them are really taking into account our kind of, the kind of things we're talking about here right now, like archival kind of science requirements. So my, my angle on this is to apply that to the pro the provenance audit trails for information that goes into audit so that they're they, they stay so that you can actually verify the, the the authenticity of the source now whether the actual information is accurate um, is a separate issue and I think uh, Vicky's done some excellent research on this as well where there's a kind of on the kind of topology of you know the what what is what makes something trustworthy and it breaks down to different categories that a you need to have authentic authentic information but then B is the actual content of the information accurate. And those are two separate roles. You might be playing, so again, it's good to separate those and be explicit about them. And in some cases, the service or the professional might be doing both. But in a lot of cases, I think what, what Vicky's arguing now is that archivists should be concerned about delivering um, uh, authentic evidence, uh, whether the content is in fact true or false is, is, a, is a role of a historian or whoever's making this, forming an opinion on this information. So, um, I'm not sure I'm asking a question. I think I'm just more responding and adding to what Vicky's saying. I don't know if that raises any. Well, I think, you know, thanks for, for sharing that. I, I think you, um, you've touched on, you know, so many different issues that we really have to grapple with. And, and I would just say, like, if, we're, if you're, you're struggling with, you know, uh, questions of personal truth um, versus a collective truth, um, because I think, you know, uh, at some level, you know, the challenge is that we do have to resolve to a consensus. And I learned from blockchains about this, you know, at some point we need to believe in something collectively to have a society and a society is shaped around its shared beliefs. And what we're having right now is a fragmentation of society because we don't share the same beliefs and we, um, and, and we, you know, we have a very pluralistic society, which is very inclusive of different beliefs and validating different beliefs, but but we ought, we live in many ways in sort of epistemological silos, and and what I found great inspiration recently in reading a lot of the writings in social epistemology, and I highly recommend you know to dig into that body of literature as you struggle with these questions of what is true, what is you know personal truth versus objective truth. Is there an objective truth? Uh, social epistemology has is, is really got a lot of insights for, for archivists, computational archival scientists, and, uh, and uh, you know, students of, of archival science uh, that we can, we can really learn from. Um, so I, I think, I don't know, there's so much that we could really dig into and explore, but we, um, Richard, I'm going to turn it back over to you to just guide us and, you know, like where we should go, how much more um, time we have. I have I have the feeling, so I'm looking at the list of participants, that again, there is no one from the first talk, which is, is that true? I don't see any names. I hope I'm mistaken. So S. Kupili Venkata, S. Decker, D. Kirch, 
and a nix i don't see anyone this was too bad because this is a presentation on the important topic of preservation of email archives so are you there invoking this group i don't think so do you guys see anyone no so um so we're doing great on time <laughs> Um, the, the next presentation is, uh, I think it's uh, Jennifer, right? At 2.20. So, um, so yep. we're, ahead, we're ahead of schedule even, unless I'm missing someone here. Calling once, calling twice. Okay, we have a, we're, we're slightly ahead of schedule, so would, it, would anyone like to elaborate on... Um, on this ongoing conversation. I see Eric, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes. And um, yeah, I'm actually kind of glad that we we were getting you guys were getting around to to the epistemological frames and the construction of truth stuff. Um, because I mean, I come at this. So I, I'm a computer scientist, but I have a lot of background in history and history of science and technology studies. Um, so like Latour and all that type of stuff. But, but um, also like critical theory, Hayden White and historiography, um, like the, the notion that there is any sort of empirical truth in, in history circles is kind of not, there isn't really. I mean, there's, 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 you're taking an organization of evidence and you're presenting a narrative about human activity, right? That can be critiqued and discussed. And so within um, the contours of different arguments, you can kind of, you know, tease out what might actually be, you know, some like centroidal, you know, uh, like accuracy of, of ideas. I'm kind of just curious from the, cause I don't, so since I'm kind of a tourist everywhere, the specific distinctions of terminology, I think kind of get tripped up a lot, at least for me, as far as, um, archival versus non-archival provenance and, and these types of deals. But I'm kind of curious about the, uh, the, the need to have a fact as a thing like just the, the epistemological idea there, like you have the evidence, right. That's going to show something about the world, but like, is that the same as divining a fact from it? And then claiming that, that the context for that evidence supports this claim. I'm just, cause that's, that's, that's kind of the hinge with a lot of historical investigation is like what your evidence is actually showing and what you are actually trying to prove, which is also why scientific history kind of fell apart as a methodology in the 20th century, because you can't scientifically really prove that something happened, right? You have an interpretation based on a select set of evidence as a single human being that can do, you know, only so much understanding. Um, and so I'm actually kind of just curious for the design of these systems and that type of thing. Like, do you, is the, is this like historical framing stuff coming in, right? Is it, is the authenticity of just the evidence staying around versus it defining a fact for a narrative of historical construction? Like that's just kind of where I want to, I just had, had a thought on that, right? Um, so I don't really have a question, right? But that's just, it seems like a lot of these, this, these conversations, you know, have come up a lot in historical study, right? And amongst historians. So I'm just kind of bringing that up here um, yeah. a little bit. Thank you so much, Eric. I, I you know, absolutely. Um, historiography is another great source of inspiration for thinking about this. And, and your question about facts, like, do we need facts? Actually, uh, that that would be a great title of a paper. <laughs> Do we need facts? And, and probably it's been written by um, uh, an epistemologist. And there's a lot of, um, in, you know, something in philosophy. Um, th there's been work, actually, and there are epistemologists who reject the very idea of a fact. And um, I have used the term, but in quotes in my book, and because I I actually think it complicates the issue. And I prefer the term evidentials um, as a kind of a broad encompassing category that encompasses records, archival documents, but also other kinds of documents. And by documents, um, the original, I go back to kind of the 13th century de definition of a document that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a written text. Um, and my student, um, Deanne, who's going to be presenting on NFTs um, later on, will we'll talk about, you know, tokens as documents, documenting the transfer of land. Um, so a more all-encompassing notion of, of evidentials will serve us well, too, as we mo move forward when we design these, these systems. Uh, and we've got, you know, we've got prospective archival science, which is about designing systems that... Um, you know, are, are meant to provide the, um, 
the, the, the mechanisms by which we can um, preserve and make discoverable uh, these, these sources, future sources of evidence. Um, and then we've got, you know, uh, retrospective archival sciences was more about um, preserve, you know, preserving those, making those available for use, determining after the fact their authenticity and so on. So archival science looks, you know, it, 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 is, it, it looks both ways. But I think facts, you know, this notion of fact complicates our epistemolog epistemological lives and, and our uh, archival lives. And I, I much prefer the notion of evidentials as the, the kind of encompassing frame. Now, it also brings me to the question of like records and archival documents. And we're used to thinking about these as kind of unitary objects and things, things, we thing them and we make them outside of ourselves. And what I kind of explore, you know, in my in my writing is like we I think and, and has come out in some of the work on digital archives is that, you know, we're not dealing with a unitary object. We know that it's a complex, you know, it's a complex object. It's an assemblage and even a performance of um, you know, software that is actually executing. And then you get a record that presents to you and it's an assemblage of different software components and libraries and you know, et cetera, et cetera, we, which we're all familiar with. Um, so we have to, I think we have to stop thinking about records in that kind of like, you know, uh, we, uh, you know objectifying it, but also recognizing, you know, as I have come to recognize or come to, you know, think about in in the context of my blockchain research that you know we are part of the record um the record you know and if you think about a blockchain system a record is you know is created out of the interaction of social actors interacting with technical components or what latour would call actants and out of that comes this you know ledger and this shared epistemological reality so records aren't outside of ourselves we're 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 in deeply implicated in in records and so maybe we stop need to stop thinking about records as things outside of ourselves but being a part of the ongoing shaping of the record as a complex system and it, it doesn't as it, with any complex system we create it at any given time you know as a collection of social actors participating in the formation of this shared epistemological space and social space and and you know construct a space that constructs our material reality too if you buy into latour which i do and but it evolves over time so there's no sharp divide between the past and the present in that way it's an it's a it's an evolution or it's a you know it's the way that the complex system actually you know evolves and i say evolves but you know with the complex systems it could be quite stochastic and it could be like you know sudden um breaks and and so on so anyway it's it's a it's a big jump from you know kind of the, the where how we have thought about records and and um you know facts in the past to the way i like to think about them now myself um but i think there you know this gives us more at the end of the day i think it gives us more um analytical power in the both in the design of our systems and understanding what we're doing when we're designing these systems and also the recovery of knowledge from those systems going forward yeah thank you okay so we thank you very much this was our our little uh bridge aside um that that kind of uh you know um um developed into uh, this interesting conversation. So it's 2.20, we're back on track. And Jennifer, are you ready to, to can you share your screen? How would you like to do this? I'll share my screen.